what I want to do is to create a context for my talk uh, within on-site optimization. So this is going to be about actually optimizing the website. So you have all this beautiful traffic that you bought most likely, and then you have some visitors that go to your website and you want to get a bit more conversion out of these visitors. That's what it's going to be about here. And because it's an e-commerce conference, I'm going to talk within the context of web shops. But what I'm going to tell you does also is also applicable on other types of uh, uh, websites, of course. But I'm going to talk about uh, the part where we actually identify issues on our website. So we uh, identify problems or barriers for conversion or look at potentials uh, to increase conversion. So that's the first part of this. I'm sure very well-known optimization process. They can look sli slightly different, uh, but this is the one I use and it contains all the basic stuff about identifying potentials, redesigning or changing things. And then if you're lucky, you get to measure what works too. So um, the thing is I work with a lot of web shops. I've been working with conversion optimization for more than 10 years and I've seen a lot of web shops uh, come and go, so to speak. And the thing is I've, noticed a pattern that goes across all of them, which I'm going to share with you and use to help you maximize your efforts to pick the right uh, tools, the right methods, and also spend your time well in your optimization process. Now, the thing is, if you look at a web shop over time, the more resources you spend, the more mature your web shop will be in sense of conversion optimization. Basically, hopefully your conversion rate will, uh, rate will increase. But the thing is when I look at web shops, first look at a web shop, I will go like, okay, let's see how they're doing here. So what, how, how much time have they spent? How many resources have they spent on the shop? And I can quickly define what's the right tool to use, what's the right method to use. I'm going to talk about three key methods here best practice, user testing, and split testing. And I know there's, there are many other things you can work with, but these are three important pillars. And I'm going to say that in my experience, there's a natural progression for these three methods, uh, methods, and I'm going to walk you through that progression and spend around 10 minutes on each for the next uh, half hour time. Now, the reason why I put them in this progression is because I think it's important not to do any user testing before you've done your best practice work. And I think it's important not to spend too much time on split testing until you've done at least user testing and the best practice work. So there's a progression here that is important and I will uh, show you why. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why do I believe that you have these important parts in your maturity, in your development? Uh, what is it that they can do for you and your web shop on these different stages? I'm going to give you concrete examples of what I would do if I were to work with any of these three tomorrow. So very practical as well. I'm going to show you what I would do to, when, I, when I'm working with these methods. And hopefully you're inspired. And if you haven't worked with any of these before, maybe that will kickstart you and get you moving forward with some of these things. And of course, I have to tell you a little bit about why. When are you ready to move on to the next step? When do I believe that your web shop is ready to move on to the next step? So that's the plan. Three little chapters here that hopefully we can get through uh, in the next half hour time. And also, like George said, uh, please have a look at the at the polls because I've I've done some questions um, regarding each part. I won't be able to bring them into the presentation. There isn't time for that, but hopefully uh, that you, we can have a little follow up at some point uh, with that, or they can just inform you. So, best practice. What do I actually talk about? What do I mean when I say best practice? Because this is a widely used term and it can mean many things. To me, especially when we talk about web shops, best practice means that there's a lot of aggregate data out there about how users like to use web shops, how we have a lot of knowledge from user testing. We have a lot of knowledge from keeping test split testing all sorts of things. And that all that knowledge together to me is the body of best practice. And I think it's very important to look towards that when you first start off uh, improving your website. Now, the really important thing about web shops is that to be honest, they are very similar, which means they all consist of the same building blocks, like a front page, category pages, product pages, filtering, sorting, navigation, basket, checkout flow, 
did I lose? Did I miss anything? I mean, those are the basic components of, of a web shop. And for many, many web shops, they are very, very similar. That's one important thing to remember when it comes to best practice. The other important thing to remember when it comes to best practice is that we have so much knowledge out there about what users like to do on these websites. We have so many user tests uh, that show us if you, for instance, say do a search, what do users expect? And the thing is, most users, they spend time on your web shop. No, everybody else's web shop, which is actually something usability guru Jacob Nielsen calls his first law of, uh, of usability or something like that. I don't think it's his law. It's just the fact about the internet that your user spends most of the time on other people's web shops. And this means that they, they gather, they aggregate, they put together all this uh, experience. And when they meet your web shop, that is what they expect. Just like you can see people expecting your search to work like Google, because that's where they do most of the searches. So this is really important when it comes to best practice. Let me be a little bit more practical. Now I'm going to do this within a mobile context. So all my examples today are going to be mobile for two reasons. One, your traffic on your web shop in many countries, at least I can only talk about the shops that I do, but they have 60, 70 plus percent mobile visits. So nowadays it's more mobile visits to most shops, which means that we really have to make sure that the mobile part works. I know the conversion rate is low on your mobile part. <clears throat> That's just natural, but let's look at thing. Conver from a conversion perspective, from a mobile, from a, also from the mobile perspective. And also, I know we've been talking about mobile first for years now, but many, many companies and many, many developers still sit with their big desktop screen when they do their development. And a lot of optimizers also sit in front of their screen and do the optimization. So maybe it's time that we do uh, mobile conversion optimization. So that's what it's going to be today. But of course, most of these things also count on desktop. Now, what you're going to see now are just four examples of websites where I believe that best practice would be fine to identify issues and make uh, improvements. No need to user test or split test any of this stuff. So here are four, four examples. I'll just briefly go through them. First one, um, hopefully you can see the little animation here that shows, I'm pointing to my screen, sorry, it's down here. You can see the animation that shows that there's a dropdown where you can select the number of products. There are many dropdowns on this website and common for all of them is that if you open them, you can't click anywhere else on the website. So the user would open the dropdown and then they, they won't select, don't want to select anything, maybe because it's already the, the right selection, but they can't get out of the dropdown. They can't click any, anywhere outside. Clearly a UX issue that make a lot of users tap um, without uh, having anything uh, happen on the website. Now the next example here is a, it's a site where you have filtering and they, those are nice filters. But when you close the filters, the users can't see A, that the filters are on, and B, what filters are on. So when they start looking into products, they forget the filtering, or they go to the toilet and come back. They forgot, forget the filtering, can't see that the filters are on, and they wonder why they can't find products of a certain kind. And the biggest crime you can do is to have products in your catalog that users don't see or don't find. So you have to be able to show that the filter is on, and what, what things are actually in the filter. In this filter, when it's closed, you can't see what filters are active. This is another page here where you have also have filtering. Uh, actually, you don't have any sorting. So if, if users want to sort by price, say they want the cheapest product first, they can't do that. This is something users expect now because they find that on most pages. So that's clearly a best practice violation. Also, the, um, the type of filters on this page, for instance, you can't filter by price. And that's also something that users would expect. So you can filter by all sorts of things that are very product specific, but not really about the product features. And the last example here, you have a search field and you can type into that search field and you can press enter and you can have your search results. But then if you wanna change your search query, if you wanna refine your search, you will have to retype. So you, can't, you can read under, underneath what you've been searching before, but it's been deleted from the actual search field. This is also, best practice violation. You need to keep this search query in the field, make sure that this little word search disappears and the users can see what they've searched on and they can refine it if they can't see what they find what they're looking for. Now, for these four examples, there are two things that are important about them, or three. First, it takes me a minute or two to find each example on these websites. 
if I spend 10 more minutes on this website, I'll be able to find 10 more best practice violations, things that you can fix because we know that this is what users expect because this is an, would be an improvement to the website. Two, these are things where we actually can find definitions of what users expect and we can actually find, so we can actually identify the best solution in each case. And three, these are your websites. Yeah, four of you are sitting out there going like, I recommend, I recognize that design because these are your websites. And the point is, if I was given all the web shops for the participants on particip for people participating in this conference, I would be able to identify something similar on each of them. So that means that you can very quickly, when you know about best practices, you can really quickly identify issues. Now, of course, you can raise the question, but that's just your opinion, Ole. What do you think, think about that? But that's not really how I work. See, what I do is I have a catalog. I have a place, I have a place where I go. So this is what I would do if I were doing best practice today. I would go to my source, and I'm sure there are many different sources that you can find around the world. I, I'm sure that each country even have, will have uh, some sort of specialist or you can read out, reach out to your local consultant. Um, but there are companies that worldwide wide look into this sort of thing. One of them happens to be in Denmark. It's called Baymart Institute, which is my go-to source. Now, what they do at Baymart Institute is that they have benchmark, uh, they, they, they benchmark performances for e mobile e-commerce. So these, they have all these categories you see here, like mobile homepage, navigation, search, and so on. And then they benchmark a lot of websites on this list, which is the dot colored dots that you can see here. If you open up each category, you would have these guidelines. So you would have like, say, how to position and style sort by and filter list features, which is something that is relevant for what we looked at just before. And then you can go and see what websites do it wrong and which, what websites do a good job. So you can also sort of check out their solutions and copy them if you want to do that. And you have a long description of what might the problem be and what are users expecting. So if you don't have anywhere to go, at least now you know you can go to Baymart Institute. I really recommend their stuff. Danish company, yes, but it's a, they have a worldwide view. Now, what they have here, which you don't, is that they have, they have thousands and thousands of research hours under their belt. So they have so many user tests of all aspects of their of, of e mobile e-commerce. This is something that you would never be able to reproduce on, unless, of course, you started a similar company. So for the individual company, like the individual web shop, you won't have access to so much stuff about what users uh, want, how users behave in, in relationship with different types of features. So this is so powerful. And there's no need to start split testing this before you've been through guidelines like these. So that's what I would do for best practice on a more practical level. Now, the question is, when would you move on from uh, best practice? The funny thing about this process with best practice uh, user testing and split test is it actually goes for almost all projects. Every time you start a new project, let's say, okay, let's talk about the, let's talk about the, the, the sorting of a product page or, or category page. Well, first you look to best practice, then you look at, then you maybe you user test it, and maybe, maybe then you split test it. So it's it's not just a a, a global uh, progression. It can also be something you do in each project. But the time to move forward from best best practice is basically when you follow best practice. So you can go to your source and you can go, okay. So do I follow follow more or less best practice, or am I aware places where I don't follow best best practice? And I can do that with open eyes because of course there will be places like that. You can also feel that now it's time to test this with users. We've actually picked the solution, and now we want to make sure that this is the right solution, that we don't have different problems uh, on our specific website. So that's there will be a need at some point to try this with real users. Of course, then you move on. You can also have features that are very specific to your domain. Say you are selling uh, very expensive goods or you're selling things with a very, very long buying cycle. There might be things that you can not really compare to any best practice catalog. Or you could be in a completely different domain, like you're selling luxury yacht uh, ships and, you, and you, don't, you, you can't really go and compare that with anywhere else. Of course, then you have to move forward because you start moving from the sort of the common domain, which is similar for all web shops into a more uh, unique domain.
And that's actually something I just want to add to this little model. It's a little layer here of common and unique. Because the thing is, what really changes is that at some point you move into something that is unique for your web shop. Because, of course, your web shop is a little different from everybody else's web shop. And the whole point is that when you start user testing, you can start test things that are unique to your shop. But best practice is really what's common for all shops. If you start looking at best practice that is only knowledge from like one or two other similar shops, it's not very powerful, not very strong. So you need to, need to have a trusted source. Now, when you move into the unique part, it's time to start looking at user testing. So let's move forward to into that domain. I know I'm talking a lot and I'm talking fast. I hope this thing is recorded and you will get the slides and you will be all fine. You can sit in your own time and go through it and you can jump to the chapter that's important to you. All right, so user testing. What's really, really super important about user testing is to understand that you're testing with real people. And you go like, duh, we know that. But it's I can't emphasize enough how important it is to include real people in your research. Now, you need to see users solve real tasks on your website, having real problems in the in an almost uh, real excuse me context. So, and this is important. You could actually, if if in your company, if you if if the people involved in optimizing the website have never seen users, you need to send those videos around, and so everybody can see what it it is like to be a user of your website shop. So, real people solving real tasks, having real problems in a real context, like on their mobile phone, <clears throat> for instance, lying on the sofa while they are also watching the the Premier League game and eating crisps, you know, that situation. So you want to get as close to that as possible, which is one of the things about user testing is that sometimes it's a little bit staged, but you have to get as close as, as you can. So um, this is the scenario. This is a typical scenario of user testing when I've been testing on mobile phones. I've done hundreds, maybe thousands of user tests. Uh, I do them all the time. Um, and usually when it's mobile testing, we would normally do something like this. I would simil have, have similar equipment. Uh, and um, it's interesting to talk about what are the, 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 what are the key barriers for doing user testing, because I would say that everybody needs to do user testing. And it's something that everybody can do. There are so many great books about this out there. Everybody can do user testing. So let's just talk briefly about what would stop you from user testing. So the two things that will stop you from user testing is one, you don't understand the value of the user test. And this is clearly because you haven't done it before. Now, I'm not accusing anyone of anything here. I'm just saying that if you are an optimizer, if you are someone like me who works on improving websites, I'm sure if you take all the consultants you can find, they will all say that user testing is still one of the most powerful methods that we have in the toolbox when it comes to optimizing websites, because you almost always get something valuable out of the tests. Uh, if you don't get anything out of it, we'll get back to why that could be, but that is actually uh, actually rare. Maybe then you should ask some different questions. Now, the other barrier that we see quite often is that people go like, oh, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of, it's expensive, you take all this planning, all this setting up, all these resources, all these things we have to do, and then it's just it just becomes too much because we're busy. Yeah, we're busy with, with what we do normally, whatever that <laughs> that is, if it is an optimization. So those are two barriers. And I like to break them down right now because I think they are actually not really valid. And I'm going to do it by showing you how to do mobile user testing in two minutes. All right. So this means everybody can do it and it takes no time. And there are a few reasons why this is so accessible now. So here's what you're going to do. Just allow, for, you know, allow me just to like lecture you about mobile user testing 2021. So you're going to write a number of questions. I would say seven or eight will do. Your question is going to start very broad. So if you have a clothing web shop, you sell shoes and other things, you start off by having a scenario like you want to buy a new pair of shoes. You're going to a party next week and you, uh, you've you been told that this website some some way you can look. So that's what you're going to do. You write that scenario down and then you let people loose on your website. And then you can pick, your tasks can become more and more specific. So don't don't worry about asking, okay, pick all the shoes uh, and, and filter them by uh, under a certain amount and a certain color. So you can see people interact with the different uh, different tools. So start wide and be, be more and more specific. 
You can also ask about returning goods or empty basket or all sorts of things. Seven or eight tasks. Now you're going to email those questions to say to a number of people. Five, at least, uh, is what we say is an industry standard. But why not 10? Why not 20? Why not 50? I'm sure you have access either through your website or social media or your local, your personal network to email this to five iPhone users. I'll tell you in a minute why it needs to be iPhone. To begin with, it doesn't have to be iPhone, but start with iPhone users. Then you're going to ask them to record their screen and solve the tasks on your website while they talk out loud. Now, this sound, could sound advanced to some people. It really isn't. I'll show you in a minute. Something everybody can do. I have people in my user testing panel from 18 to 70 years old. Everybody can do it, all right? So everybody can look at the website, record the phone, solve the tasks while they talk. And then what you're going to do, you're going to request them to send that video file to you. And uh, you can do this by Dropbox. And I picked Dropbox because who doesn't have a Dropbox? So Dropbox actually allows you to uh, request the file and then you can give them a voucher. In Denmark, with this type of test, half an hour test, I give people 25 euros. That might differ from country to country. To country. What you have to do on your phone is all you have to do is like you have to add screen recording to the control center, which is something you will have to show the user how to do. Then you have to start the recording in the control center, and then you have to turn the mic on. Three steps. You can copy this slide and pass that along to your in your email. And this is very easy. Anyone can do that. And then you can start recording on the phone. People do the tasks, take them, say, 20 minutes, half an hour. You can go to your Dropbox and say, I want to re request a file. And every time people upload a file, they will have a receipt. You will have a receipt. Dropbox does everything else. Perfect, simple tool. I don't know if it comes for free with a standard Dropbox, but if you have an account there, you can do that. So with that, voila, I've just taken all mobile user testing companies out of the business because now you can do it yourself. If I send out these tasks in the morning, the next day in my Dropbox, I have easily 10 user tests of half an hour. So this is so easy to do that everybody should just do it all the time. And you can then sit down, watch the videos, pen and paper. And if you see people having any issues, bam, there you go. Super easy, uh, lots of value, didn't take very long to do. So user testing, so powerful. We all know how to do it. Now you know how to do it really quickly on your mobile phone. So let's talk a little bit instead about when is it that you run out of uh, use with the user testing? When is it that you have to move on to something else? There was many good reasons, but I'm just going to pick a few specific ones. So at some point, you'll see all these user tests and you go like, okay, that's nothing, nothing new. No one really ha have any really big issues. And that will probably happen. Uh, not that you should stop user testing, but it's, it's a good, it's, it's a, it is a problem that really good web shops don't really have, you don't see much in these user tests. I'm not going to tell you that you shouldn't do the user testing, but I'm just saying this is the time where you have to go like, okay, maybe we should try some different things. Also, maybe you need statistical data. You can do a lot of user testing and be very quantitative, but it doesn't really suit the think, uh, think aloud style. So maybe you want some more hardcore evidential type of data. So that could be also a reason why you move forward from the user testing. Also, you don't think that people give any feedback on the things you like to know about. So let's say you want to know about, I don't know, button color or something, and no one says anything about that in your user tests. And then you start hitting a problem because there are certain things you can't ask your users. And if you can't ask them, well, you can ask them, but they can't answer. Or if they give you an answer, it's a really shitty answer. And I will tell you what that's, why that situation is, and that's going to be my segue to the next part. So let's talk a little bit about things that you want to split test because you can't use the system. So, ladies and gentlemen, have a, a look at this amazing visual illusion now. I said illusion because this is an illusion. I'm going to ask you, are these two tables the same size? And when I ask you like that, I'm sure that some of you already go like, ah, hang on here, there's, there's something fishy going on. And there is, because when you immediately look at this picture, you would think that the one on my left, at least, is the tall one, is taller and, and slimmer than the other one, which is wider, yeah? So you go like, these two tables aren't the same. This is interesting for many reasons. First of all, because we all see that. So you can't unsee the, 
the, the difference between the two tables. And also, you have an immediate reaction from your brain going like, these two tables are not the same. Now, allow me to fiddle around and illustrate it with this uh, area, and you will see that is actually the case. This is an illusion, because when things are vertical or horizontal, the brain decodes them in a different way, which is why the moon is very big when it's close to the horizon, for instance. The moon didn't change shape, or it's not something with the with the with the, how the the light goes through the atmosphere. No, it's because it's closer to the atmosphere. Your brain thinks it's closer. Now, this is really interesting because this says a lot about how the brain is making decisions. If I may use that term, the brain making decisions, <laughs> because what's actually going on is that there are multiple systems at play here. One system have will have a quick answer and go like, these two tables are not the same. And another system in your brain will go like, hang on, these, these are different. Ola just told me so, and he's a trusted source. Now, you might recognize that way of dividing things from Dan Kahneman. Many of you, I'm sure, uh, have read the book by this uh, very nice-looking elderly gentleman. This amazing book introduces System 1 and System 2 as two different systems, where one is the also on an evolutionary uh, progression, the first the reptile brain, the quick one that quickly makes decisions and bomb that, that siphons through all the in information we get from all our senses and all that. And this system one actually prepares, uh, prepares decisions for system two, the conscious brain, you know, the voice you have in your head, the way you can talk to yourself, that other system where you actually think about things. So like the difference between two plus two, that system one, fast, and you know the answer right away. You don't have to think about it. Oh, the other question, 17 times 24, you have to think about it. Just like Steve Krug said, don't make me think. What is he talking about? Using system two. Yes. So two systems, one is fast and one is not as fast. And one is automatic and one you have to use your brain. Now, this is so interesting because this is exactly why I've, I find split testing really interesting. Because what's happening here is that you are ask, actually asking people things they can't answer. So if you do a test and you show people two buttons and you go like, in which example would you buy more, the green button or the orange button? The answer you would get there would be complete and utter bullshit because people do not know the decision making going on inside the brain about which color they would choose. So they would start thinking about, oh, I went to university and they said something about green is the color of hope or something. So that's just, that's just, just in construction. That's why split testing is, is interesting because we get the actual usage data. Look at this example, two different designs, two different placements of buttons. And you can think all about as much as you want about this, but you can't really, uh, as a user say, okay, I would definitely buy the product in version A because I just like the price to be closer to the image or something. That just won't work. Now, the interesting thing here, there's a difference between conversions this example in, with 19%, 19% different. This is an example taken from a website called Guess the Test. And I urge you to go there and just hang out and have some fun and look at the examples. We can always discuss the quality of the material, but you can be inspired and you can see interesting things about how people do choices. Uh, pretty solid, 19,000 sessions. One gave a lift of 19%. Yeah, so there is a massive difference. It, it doesn't matter which one you choose for your business. Now, on Guess the Test, the website, you can actually see how many people voted. People like me, people like you, everybody can go and vote which one do you believe is the winner. That's just fun and games, yeah? But the interesting thing is that when you look at the data, you will see a pattern like this in many, many examples. So 329 people guessed, and they got it like 50-50. This is really, really important thing to understand that in most of these tests, half of the people looking at the test get it wrong. So the people that think about it and go like, well, with all my experience and knowledge, and I'm so cool, and I have this long education, half of them get it wrong. So in your situation, if you're looking at this slide in your business, in your company, and you sit there around the table and you just decide, chances are that you are, you are messing up with your conversion, 19% of your conversion rate, yeah? All right, so that's really interesting. And that happens all the time. And what does that mean? Two things. Don't ask people things they can't answer because the decision making is taking place somewhere else. And also you can't predict things, so you have to measure them. So this is why I think that split, test is, split testing is so cool, besides from also being uh, scientific or 
uh, quantitative or with data or real uses data and all these other things that are exciting about split testing, then I think you are ready to start split testing in your web shop when you start to want to test things that you can't really ask users and you can't find in your best practice. So how about the how? What would I test? Well, to be perfectly honest, the thing I would do is I would take the things that I see in my user test and I would use that to build my hypothesis for my split test. So user testing is an amazing way to prepare your split testing because you can see things, you can see behavior that you might want to change. And split testing really is all about measuring behavior, human behavior. So as technical as it might be, it's about changing human behavior. That's why it's important to write that hypothesis because it's about what is it, which behavior changes that I want, I want to create. So it's interesting to talk about, okay, what would I suggest that you test? Because now I'm just, then I'm just picking something and you should actually test what you see in your user testing. But I'd like to challenge you and I think, let's talk about split testing, something uniquely mobile. Let's stay in the mobile context. I think it's interesting to start talking about testing things uniquely mobile. One of the reasons why I find that so interesting is because I think that many websites these days are just responsive versions of their desktop uh, counterpart. More and more are building like specific uh, um, mobile websites, like you have the burger menu and things are sort of adjusted. But often I think it's interesting to test things that are uniquely mobile. So what could be something that is uniquely mobile that you could test? That would be something like, hang on, it's jumping here. Uh, sorry, here we go. Could be something like the sticky add to cart button. This is something that is uniquely mobile. I guess you can't do it on desktop, but why would you? So you, the sticky buy button is interesting because what, what happens on the mobile is that people scroll a lot, obviously, because of the only they only have so much space. And so they scroll the buy button out of the viewport, yeah? So what you do is like you show the buy button in the viewport at all times. And this is a reminder to people to buy and therefore more people buy. The, so the story goes. Okay, so there's a little evidence here. Actually, in on guestetest.com, you can find several tests that show that you can actually increase your conversion rate. I just picked an example here. It's only 4% lift, which to many, when you reach that maturity level, is fine. If you can have consistently have split tests that give you 4%, 4%, 4%, you're happy. Don't start off with these tests where you want to have 50%. That's just not, not how it works. You can, but then maybe your next test will be minus 50%. So yeah, go for the little steps. So I picked this test because it's got 36,000 sessions. That's quite heavy. That's quite a lot of data. And I think that makes it really solid. But there are many other examples on Guess the Test that will show you that you can increase your conversion rate by adding a sticky button. Or maybe not. That depends on your website, which is why you are split testing it, isn't it? So there we go. That's, uh, that's my little framework for you. I think that if you make sure you do the right method at the right time, you will get more out of the time you spend on optimization. Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't try to do something that many people have tried before. Respect the progression. Use the data from one uh, method to the next one. And then I think that you can maximize your, your optimization uh, efforts. And uh, that's all I wanted to tell you. I hope that was an inspiration. Um, uh, so, so far, thank you so much from, uh, from me.